The nature of the gods was a question asked by many ancient philosophers and gave rise to many schools of thought and is debated even now. They're hailed in our earliest written sources as the mighty ones who rule the earth. Yet exactly how is often not explained. Sometimes they're described like men, even as the ancestors of man, while other times they take on a truly cosmic dimension. From a close analysis of the fantastic tales about them, we may be able to gain a window into their earliest conception. We will focus here on the European gods, primarily Greek and Norse. Though often called demons by Christians, we will investigate what are the gods. In the beginning there was Logos, and Logos was with God, and Logos was God. So says John chapter 1. Though Logos is often translated as the Word, yet its Greek meaning is much more ambiguous. It's here to be understood as the ordering principle, and in this there is some commonality between later Christian conceived God and the traditional folk gods of Europe. To understand the gods, it's necessary to understand their role in the world, and there's no better example than in the myths surrounding its creation. In the early European conception, there was never a state of absolute nothingness. Therefore, the creation myths are hypothetical starting points of a story that sought to explain how things came to be as they are. In the Theogony, Hesiod lays out one of the earliest versions of the Greek creation myth. With the aid of the muses, he recalls, Grant lovely song and celebrate the holy race of the deathless gods who are forever, those who were born of earth and starry heaven and gloomy night, and them that briny sea did rear. Tell how the first gods and earth came to be, and rivers and the boundless sea with its raging swell and the gleaming stars and the wide heaven above, and the gods who were born of them, givers of good things, and how they divided their wealth, and how they shared their honors amongst them, and also how, at the first, they took many-folded Olympus. While some neo-pagans view gods as earth, sun, wind, and other elements of nature, Hesiod differentiates them, the gods, he says, are born of the earth and sky. Zeus, the loud thunderer, is not the sky. While sometimes earth and sky are spoken of as gods in Greek texts, they were not typically the object of worship because they were viewed as impervious to prayer. The gods are explained by Homer and Hesiod as givers of good things, distributors. This is similar to the Slavic word for god, bog, which has its origin in an Indo-European root, meaning to divide or distribute, cognate with the Indo-Iranian Bag, the origin of the name Baghdad, meaning God-given. It conveys the idea that in some way, like men, the gods act upon the world, controlling the world, causing outcomes. This is also found in the English word God, likely related to the Gaelic Guh, meaning word or voice. God might have the meaning one who is called upon. Reasonably, one only calls upon something which can respond, and thus the gods necessarily have perception, understanding, and the ability to act upon the world to benefit the worshipper. Hesiod goes on to detail the beginning of the world and its formation and ordering. These things declare to me from the beginning, you muses who dwell in the house of Olympus, and tell me which of them first came to be. In truth, at first chaos came to be, but next, wide-bosomed earth, the ever-sure foundation of all the deathless ones who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus, and dim Tartarus in the depth of the wide-pathed earth, and Eros, fairest among the deathless gods, who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wise counsel of all gods and all men within them. From chaos came forth Erebus and black night, but of night were born Aether and day, 
whom she conceived and bore from union in love with Erebus. And Earth first bore starry heaven, equal to herself, to cover her on every side, and to be an ever sure abiding place for the blessed gods. Chaos is first. Its etymology appears rooted in the Indo-European concept of open space, possibly related to a chasm or canyon. Space by itself is dark, and so gives rise to night, but it's likewise filled with matter, which becomes earth. Eros, desire, is the principle by which these various processes unfold through union, coming together, typically explained as mating, though the poet is not under a delusion that this is a sexual union as humans understand it. This early cosmic union sees various pairs give birth to their opposites, so Erebus, gloom, unites with night, yet their children are Aether and Day, their exact opposites. Earth, as standing in the middle, gives place to the sky in the heights, and Tartarus, which is the space beneath the earth. The sky is again presented as something different from the gods. It is not called God, but it is their dwelling place. Yet there is a problem, and that problem is a lack of separation or ordering. Eros has been too effective, it seems, because in the mind of Hesiod, the sky lays down upon the earth so completely that there's no space for his children, the titans, to be born. They remained jammed in the belly of the earth. Uranus, the sky, is not what we typically think of as the sky today, the air, the clouds, space, but rather a physical dome, a solid barrier that in the archaic level of Indo-European myth was thought of as a stone ceiling within a giant cave. In order to create space for the children of earth and sky, Kronos is given by his mother a great stone sickle to sever the two apart. The uniting principle between earth and sky is imagined as his sexual member. As his other brothers expand in the four cardinal directions holding their father in place, Kronos cuts off his member, creating the airy space between them the cardinal directions and the props that forever hold the sky apart from Earth. The word chronos may come from a Proto-Indo-European word meaning to cut, the root of Greek kero, thus matching his significant mythical action, the cut that created the sky. In this way, the world's final state is almost realized, and it's into this world of space and movement that the Olympian gods are born. Though there are many differences, there are some striking similarities with Norse mythology. The Norse describe Genungaga, meaning the gaping abyss, as a location during the primordial state of the earth. It was here that the giant Ymir was born, from the fusion of hot and cold elements mixing. He consumed the milk of a great cow, Audhumbla, the cow licks another being from the salt rinds, Buri, meaning to bear, who had a son called Bor, meaning brought forth, who is the father of Odin, with Besla, daughter of Bolthorn, which appears to be another name for Ymir. Like the Greek myth, the creation of the present state of the world was created by Odin when he kills his grandfather and divides up his body creating the existing world out of its various pieces. His flesh became earth, his bones the mountains, the sky his skull, the oceans his blood, the clouds his brains. Ymir represents the natural state of the world, which must be sacrificed, cut up, and arranged by Odin in order to create the world as it exists today. Some theorize it's symbolic of the first sacrifice, which all other sacrifices afterwards were intended to imitate, setting the world right and establishing order. The act of the cutting of Odin and Kronos, though possessing significant differences, are similar enough that the two tales may be anciently connected. 
However, Ymir, instead of being the sky affixed to the earth, represents the totality of the material world, which must be cut up and divided, so that he becomes both sky and earth, and nearly everything in it. His feeding from the milk of a magical cow may represent cosmic potentiality or energy associated with the flowing waters, such as the glass govnen in Gaelic legends. The world in some form pre-existed the gods, at least in mythologically conceived time. They exist within a world as immortal as they are. It was not created out of nothing by them, but is in some way inseparable from them. Yet the powers of the gods are required for the ordering of the world. Without their governing powers, the cosmos will slip into chaos and destruction. This critical role of the gods is most dramatically highlighted in the Norse myth of Ragnarok, where the defeat of the gods leads to a destruction of the world, yet not its annihilation. There is no state of nothing or final endings, only ruin and new beginnings. In the Germanic case, the cutter, Odin, is hailed as the father of the gods. In the Greek tradition, Kronos is also the father of the gods, but made the head of a special subclass called the Titans. In Greek, the Titanes Thei, in some way separate from the Olympian gods who are the sons, daughters, and descendants of Kronos. Titans means the stretchers, possibly relating to the act of stretching out the world as they separate earth and sky. While a number of the titans are responsible for expanding the physical world, others are parts of the world, such as Helios, the sun, Seluna, the moon, Okeanos, the freshwater ocean or river thought to surround the earth, Eos, dawn. Others are connected to states of consciousness, Prometheus, forethought, Epimetheus, instinct, Metis, skill, Mnemosyne, memory. In Norse tradition, at least, some of these metal states are associated with trolls, dwarves, elves, or gods. While the sun and moon were honored in most Indo-European societies, only the Vedic tradition preserves its extensive worship as a divinity in its own right. But even there, it is evident that the conception of the sun extends far beyond its physical observable qualities. While honored for their light and power, they were seen by many as too relegated to be truly independent actors. Largely, the titans of Greek tradition seem to fall into this category. They tend to be gods who are various physical things or states. In Norse tradition, Mimir, from whom Odin gets his wisdom, means to think, to recall. It's not just a name. Mimir is thought, who is likewise Odin's maternal uncle. Odin carries around his head, which can reveal its wisdom to him. Now, this is very similar to Zeus, who consumes the titan Gmetis, meaning wisdom or skill. He wishes to possess the skill, and so he takes it into his own being, which causes him to birth Athena, the goddess of skill, from his head and she can then bestow this metis upon those she chooses. Though skill itself rests within Zeus, it's understood as a separate goddess, again, not of skill, but who is skill in a way comparable to later platonic notions of the forms. Yet while metis is skill, her daughter, combined with the nature of Zeus, is something different. She becomes active, embodied, and conscious. She distributes that skill to whom she will, and can take it away. One may perhaps conceive of the goddess as the spirit of the quality, the divine aspect which controls it. The mother of the muses was Mnemosyne, and their father was Zeus, and we can think of this again as the spirit of Zeus plus memory equals the active spirit of the form which can bestow their blessing upon whom they will. As there were different but related qualities, to Hesiod they were represented by nine sisters, 
which represent different branches of ancient knowledge and poetry, things strongly connected with the act of memorization. The same concept existed within Germanic religion as well, though the gods may not have been divided into such categories. Kronos, the great cutter, father of Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, Hera, Demeter, and Hestia. In origin, this group may have been matching pairs. Zeus unites with Hera, of course, but after this we are left to scratch for clues that fall outside the focus here. But it's no accident that Kronos fathers these children, for they represent the various spheres of the world, which have been created through his actions. Famously, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades cast lots to see who would take ownership over which realm. Zeus won heaven, Poseidon the sea, and Hades the underworld. All three gods look very similar in Greek depictions, save for their associated iconography, and sometimes Hades is even called Zeus of the Earth. Hestia arguably rules the realm of the hearth and home, Demeter the fields, and Hera the sovereignty of the kingdom ruled by her husband Zeus, though later confined mostly to motherly tasks. They are all the sons and daughters not only of Kronos, but of Hre, a name likely meaning the flowing one. The parentage combines the concepts of Kronos the Cutter who sets apart and Hre who sets in motion. Zeus and the other Olympian gods are generated from this process of the expanding and unfolding of the cosmos. Zeus rules the sky, Poseidon the sea, Hades rules the subterranean earth, and they rule over these spheres of the world as a king rules a castle. Hestia, the hearth or altar, is not the same as the physical fire, even though this is the etymological origin of her name, but is the ruler over the domestic sphere of the home, represented prominently in the Mycenaean Megaron. Demeter is not the physical earth, but the ruler over the land and fields, especially in relation to the fertility and crops. Hera arguably is the Greek expression of the feminine sovereignty, which the king must wed in order to gain authority over the land, an idea that later dies out in Greek religion, but is part of an archaic Indo-European concept. All the children of Kronos rule over spheres of the world, but none are reducible to a physical place or thing. This is most importantly emphasized in the story of Zeus himself. When he is born, he is hidden under the earth, hidden away from his father until he is fully grown. He acquires the powers of the storm through his freeing of the Cyclopes and the Hundred Handers. It is they who represent the actual physical thunder and lightning and storm winds, not Zeus. He uses their power, but he is not those things. Taking hold of this mighty power, the most awesome expression of power in the ancient world, he is able to gain the rulership of heaven. It is also possible to read this myth as a transition from night to day. During the night, Zeus is hidden beneath the earth, but due to the act of Kronos, which separates Uranus, possibly the night sky, from the earth, it allows for the emergence of the bright sky, etymologically connected to the name Zeus. The daylight sky is connected to enlightenment, overcoming, expansion, life, vision, labor, skill, order. The night is, as they say, full of terrors. Zeus dispels the darkness of the chaotic and obstructive forces, and the darkness of the unconscious. Yet the role of Zeus in cosmic order far outstrips that of the daylight sky, despite the etymological connection with the name. Zeus is the orderer, an administrator of justice, a ruler. Hesiod says, But for those who practice violence and cruel deeds, far-seeing Zeus, son of Kronos, ordains a punishment. Often even a whole city suffers for a bad man who sins and devises presumptuous deeds, and the son of Kronos lays great trouble upon the people, famine and plague together. 
so that the men will perish away, and their women do not bear children, and their houses become few through the contriving of Olympian Zeus. And again at another time, the son of Kronos either destroys their wide army, or their walls, or else makes an end of their ships on the sea. You princes mark well this punishment, you also, for the deathless gods are near among men, and mark all those who oppress their fellows with crooked judgments, and wreck not the anger of the gods. For upon the bounteous earth, Zeus has thrice ten thousand spirits, watchers of mortal men, and these keep watch on judgments and deeds of wrong as they roam, clothed in mist, all over the world. And there is Virgin Justice, the daughter of Zeus, who is honored and reverenced among the gods who dwell on Olympus. And whenever anyone hurts her with lying slander, she sits beside her father Zeus, the son of Kronos, and tells him of men's wicked hearts, until the people pay for their mad folly of their princes, who, evilly minded, pervert judgment and give sentence crookedly. Keep watch against this, you princes, and make straight your judgments, you who devour bribes. Put crooked judgments altogether from your thoughts. The eye of Zeus, seeing all and understanding all, beholds these things too, if so he will, and fails not to mark what sort of justice this is that the city keeps within it. Seeing, watching, judging, punishing, anger are not qualities possessed by inanimate parts of nature. The consequences of bad rule, of bad judgment and actions are not just how things are, but are the consequences ordained by Zeus in his role as the upholder of the cosmic order. The gods are also closely connected with consciousness and perhaps most especially Zeus. We began with the hymn to the Muses, but why are they the daughters of Zeus? Because Zeus, as pure consciousness, unites with memory to generate the creative arts. The Norse account has more esoteric examples. The medieval skald Snorri Sturluson said that Odin invented the arts and knew more than any other man. Not only does this statement link him to the comment made by Julius Caesar about the Celtic Mercury, but it emphasizes his close connection with consciousness, the mental force in the world which is the origin of arts and skill. Having understood this about Zeus, we now see that Odin is not in fact different from Zeus in this respect. Odin's name refers to him being linked to a state of mental agitation, the Furious One likely originally referring to someone who is a seer with the same etymological origins as Old Norse Odr, meaning mind or wit, and Proto-Celtic Vatis, meaning a seer. Odin is the one who sees, who knows. In myth, when Odin questions various Volva, it should be understood that he is representing the worshipper who would ask the Volva questions. The Volva ultimately obtains her knowledge from Odin, in exactly the same way as the Pythian priestess of Apollo. This can be seen from the Voluspa when, in the very opening, the Volva declares, Thou wilt, Valfather, that well I relate, old tales I remember of men long ago. As old Greek poets would call upon the muses at the start of a work, the scowled in the voice of a vulva starts with Odin and his will that they relate the tale. It goes on to give credit to Odin and his two brother aspects for creating the world. Then Bur's son lifted the level land, Midgarth the mighty. There they made the sun from the south warm the stones of earth, and green was the ground with growing leeks. But the sun and moon knew not where to go before being told by the gods who sat in council and ordered the cosmos. Odin and his brother aspects are then credited with the creation of man. Soul gave Odin, mind gave Honir, form gave Lothar and goodly hue. 
These three brothers are simply a triplified aspect of Odin himself, who is also called third and second. Odin gives Ön, meaning breath or soul. This is similar to the Vedic concept of Atman, also derived from a word for breath, acquiring a meaning of soul or self. Honir gives what here is translated as mind, from Odr, the same root as the name Odin, and Lothr gives a disputed thing, La, which I have chosen to understand here as form, although others say heat, blood, etc. It may have denoted a third part of the spirit related to the body. In any case, it's absolutely clear that Odin and his brothers give to man what we would call consciousness, in the form of both spirit and mind, and that this is the key nature of Odin as the All-Father and the Father of the Gods. From him emanates consciousness and spirit, understood as separate but united things. In the tales, Odin must go on quests to obtain knowledge, just as man must strive to learn. One brutal account is the origin of poetry. Kvasir was created from the spit of the gods as they made a treaty. He was exceptionally wise and knew everything. Dwarves killed him and poured his blood into vats and made it into mead. Odin stole it, and when he was being chased in the form of an eagle, he spat some out to the gods, but some of it dropped from his anus, which fell to the earth. Those mortals who are not truly gifted in poetry are said to be able to obtain this crappy portion. But Odin distributes the good stuff to the gods and those he favors. There are likely very ancient origins to the idea of Kvasir, which relates to an alcoholic drink known as Kvas by Russians and others, and the Vedic god Soma, which is both a god and a plant used in ritual known for mental stimulation. The dawn goddess, Eustra in English, the origin of Easter, was an important goddess also to Indo-Europeans, but again is something different from the sunrise itself. She is connected with the rising consciousness and the powers of light, the invigorating power of the dawn which causes things to waken from the sleep world of the unconscious and enlivens the mind. To the ancients, the physical world and the mental world were not only connected, but a singular thing. Consider this. In the Norse myths, the world is shaped from the body of a dead giant, with the sky being inside of his head and the clouds his brains. The gods live in the sky, in the mind of the world giant. The world and the mind are one thing, ordered by the gods who are consciousness. Well, I hope you liked the video, and please leave your comments and your own opinions below. Don't forget to start building your family tree with MyHeritage.com, link in the description below. And as always, stand tall.